Um, excellent. Some people are still joining us. So we're gonna make sure that our microphones are muted. Um, and if you don't know me, I'm Samantha Russell Blumenkerning. I'm Chief Naturalist at the Eagle River Nature Center. And you are here to learn about winter birding. Um, before we get started, um, our Nature Center building remains closed to the public for the foreseeable future, but all of our trails, including the Albert Loop, are open and available. Um, Gus, our trail crew manager, has been working hard to make sure trails are in great shape. Uh, if we have any trail crew volunteers in our audience today, extra thank you for all the shoveling and all the work you've been doing. Uh, we've been running out of work for you to do. You guys are so efficient. Um, if you do come to the Nature Center, something new that we have is a credit card based pay station um, up at the front of the building. Um, you can still pay with cash. We encourage you to renew your memberships. Um, and to come out and enjoy our trails. This is going to be our last program of the season. Uh, unfortunately, this year we're not having our annual solstice hike. Um, there's going to be no public event for that, uh, but this week we'll be posting all sorts of videos and information for how you can create your own solstice hike at home. Um, just ticking through, I think, with that, we're super excited to have a long time, 21 year and some change uh, volunteer Liza Sandin here today. She is an amazing bird expert and coordinator for the Eagle River area. Um, Nature Center, or Eagle River Area Christmas Bird Count, and she'll be talking a little bit about that. This program will be posted onto our YouTube channel. Um, if this is something that you don't have the time to look at right now, I just saw a question with that. Um, with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Liza. Thank you. Uh, thank you everybody for joining. I think uh, this is definitely the biggest class I've had for this uh, ever. I think I've done this program for about the last 15 years, maybe. And um, so it's kind of fun, a bit of a format. Um, and I do this program uh, right around usually between uh, early December uh, to really try and promote people to do the, uh, especially the Eagle River Christmas bird count, but any of uh, your local uh, Christmas bird counts. They are uh, in Anchorage, there's a Matsu count in Eagle River plus several on the Kenai, Kodiak, uh, they're throughout, uh, throughout the state, throughout the country, and actually throughout the world. And this year, I believe, uh, is 121st uh, Christmas bird count. And uh, I also just wanna uh, start by anybody, anybody here who is a, a more experienced birder, you'll probably find this just maybe a uh, easy review of what is common in the Eagle River area. Um, I really try and keep this uh, as accessible birding. This is birding for people who don't necessarily uh, know the difference between uh, different types of songbirds, but like, that's a duck, that's something like a robin, that's something like a chickadee, and that's something like a raven. If you can kind of go between those, this is the presentation for you. And um, I do wanna start with just some basics for covering uh, some of the questions that I've often had I do want to encourage you if you have questions to type them in the chat box and uh, Samantha will cut in or remind me and I'll try to keep an eye on the chat box as well. Um, but people always ask me about bird guides. So I have my stack next to me of my uh, kind of go-to guides that I've used over the years. Um, like Samantha said, I've been uh, doing programs in the Nature Center for about 21 years. And these are kind of the ones that I've defaulted to and some new ones for me. So my first and oldest one is the uh, Sibley Guide. And there is a Eastern and a Western and you can get the whole country at once, but it's, uh, it has some nice drawings to it. Um, I've more recently changed to the National Geographic Bird Guide. It's also for the whole country. Um, and it has kind of like multiple birds on one page, which is a nice way to compare uh, similar species. Specific to Alaska, um, there are a couple uh, Alaska bird guides. This is the more detailed bird guide book. It's the bird guide, Guide to the Birds of Alaska by Robert Armstrong. And one thing I really like, uh, like about this one is it has a little box uh, per species that notes for different regions of Alaska, is it common, uncommon, rare, which can kind of, you know, point you in the right direction. If it's says it doesn't occur in winter in South Central Alaska, um, it's most likely not the bird you're looking at, but it can be, it does happen. Um, 
to find places to go birding, this is the a birder's guide to Alaska, and it lists uh, kind of birding hotspots to go to. And if you're traveling around Alaska, it can be a, a nice way to say, hey, let's pull over here and look at this lake, um, or let's take this drive uh, to see what's special there. And the next thing I want to encourage is lots of uh, uh, animal track bird, uh, animal track guides. There are some that include birds, and there are some sp specific bird track books. And especially with this being winter, um, activity in the trees and on the snow, on the ice, whether it's little tracks or um, a spot where the dippers are popping out of the creek and onto the snow and ice on a creek. Um, and so this is a nice reference, but there are several uh, animal track books. And let's see, are there any questions to start from anybody? Samantha, do you see any? Uh oh, so I'm I'm going to message Linda McCarthy Beckworth um, privately. There's some audio issues, but beyond that, I am not seeing any um, problems or any okay. questions. I'm so sorry. Okay. Other people that are on video, can you give me a thumbs up if you're hearing me? Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> that helps. Um, so let me pull up my presentation. And is everybody seeing this presentation? Can you tell me, Santa? I can't see the chat anymore. So you're not sharing yet. Not sharing yet. Okay, let me go back and fix that. Ha ha ha. <laughs> All right, looking good. And now let me see if I can minimize this. Ah, no, not what I meant to do. <laughs> Okay, now do you see my whole screen? Yes, looks great. Okay, okay, great. So this is winter birds and it's specifically the most common winter birds in Eagle River, Alaska. Um, Anchorage actually has a lot more bird diversity than we do in Eagle River. So I'm not covering some birds that if you live in Anchorage or work in Anchorage, you might actually see uh, throughout the winter. Um, this is just the basics, my uh, plug for the bird count. The Eagle River area count is January 3rd. Um, next Saturday is the Anchorage bird count. And I believe the Matsu count is on Sunday. Um, and you can find information on that online. If you wanna register, um, you need to send me an email address, uh, an email. And this is available on the Nature Center's website. And also if you go to the uh, Audubon's Join CBC, during the Christmas bird count, you have to search for Eagle River Alaska and then click on that little icon and it'll come up. And I made a Facebook group called Eagle River Christmas Bird Count and it's new today. So there's nothing up there yet. Um, and it will be different with it being a COVID year Christmas bird count. But I wanna now just get into the, uh, the most common birds. So I kind of broke this out as these are the 24 most common birds and 12 of these you probably already know, even if you do not know the name of the bird, but you've seen it enough, they say, oh yeah, that's the duck with a green head. And so the duck with a green head is the uh, mallard duck. It's only the male that has the green head. The female is a pretty generic looking brown duck. Many female duck species have this uh, pretty generic brown coloring. There is differences when you really get, uh, you know, really look at them closely with binoculars and you really get into birding. But uh, many people are surprised that we have ducks year round. And we have had ducks year round uh, in increasing numbers over the years. Um, and what they often do is they stay in flocks and they almost maintain their own open water. They'll uh, find it where a creek's flung into a pond and that's where they hang out. But as, if they get on the thin ice, they can actually crack it open and they'll uh, create those spots. But often they'll be on lakes right where a creek flows in or a creek flows out of it. 
because that's where uh, the water is most likely to be open instead of iced over. Um, let's see. We have uh, actually two other waterfowl species that uh, are regularly seen in winter in Eel River, the common golden eye. And this is actually a very small duck, um, about two thirds the size of a mallard duck. And the male mallard, the, mo the male common golden eye has, uh, is really a black and white duck. And it has this uh, circular white patch uh, just behind its bill, between the bill and its eye. And in summer, you'll see, we also have a different golden eye species, the Barrow's golden eye, which has a comma shaped eye patch or face patch, um, but they tend to not be here in winter. The female golden eye um, is also gonna have kind of a somewhat generic drab brown coloring in winter. She'll get more showy as we approach springtime and have more distinct color patterns. But right now, this time of year, they're often just kind of a duller brown gray duck, but the male is still gonna have the black and white pattern colorings. The third uh, common duck species in winter is actually a very large duck. So he's gonna be about one third to 50% larger than the mallard duck. And that's the common merganser. This uh, common merganser also, we have a, a difference in appearance between male and female. The male, his head can be, depending on how the light hits them, can be either a black color or even you'll see some uh, blue and green tones in it. What's most distinctive about the common merganser is going to be that they have a very long, skinny beak. Um, it can, uh, look, you know, somebody said it's almost kind of like a knife, a knife-like beak to me once. The beak is almost, is also uh, often as long or longer than their head is. So if their head was, you know, it looked to you to be about three inches wide, the bill's about three inches wide. And I always wear the beak and bill interchangeably, um, just because I, out of old habits. Um, the Female merganser is going to be uh, mostly brown and gray tones. In this slide here, you can kind of see on the female, she's the one in the uh, bottom corner. Uh, her feathers can get kind of ruffled up by the wind, uh, giving it kind of a windblown look or a actually kind of a squared off blocky look to their head. Whereas you're seeing on the male up here, he has, you know, it's pretty rounded uh, head shape. And the difference there is strictly in uh, whether or not the feathers are uh, kind of tossed up by the wind, whether the duck's been diving a lot and it's kind of smoothed down. When they are diving, they'll come up and they'll ruffle the feathers, giving it kind of a more disheveled, windblown look as well. And I'm gonna go to the next slide, but again, this is, this is new to me doing a Zoom class and I can't see anybody. <laughs> So uh, are there any questions on the uh, waterfowl or the duck-like species? This is strange to me. Yeah, it's looking, folks aren't um, asking questions about okay. the things. You're explaining it well, Liza. Okay, thanks. This is But this it is, is hard strange. without that audience engagement. Yeah, it's like I can't see anybody's eyes. They're looking confused or something. <laughs> or excited. Um, so moving away from the waterfowl, and I should add that this presentation is in the order in which you would find these birds in a bird guide, um, at least a bird guide that's not organized by color. Um, and it's uh, just a taxonomic order of species um, that uh, is way more detailed, but that's why this is kind of sorted this way. So the bald eagle is uh, one of our most common birds in Eagle River. They used to be a woman in Eagle River who fed the eagles at the old fire station. And over the years, the Anchorage landfill has had in the past incredibly large numbers of eagles. It has moderated significantly due to improved landfill practices, um, but it's still a bird that we often have in the hundreds. Uh, Several years ago, we had a uh, 
peak count of 555 bald eagles during uh, the two hour count window that we count eagles in Eagle River. Um, we only count eagles for the Christmas bird count for the first uh, two hours of the count, the two, first two hours of daylight, which is 10 a.m. till noon, because they do move around significantly. Uh, they tend to perch overnight at the near the landfill and then they disperse during the day and then return at night. So, but the, so the bald eagle, we've pretty much all seen the eagle. Um, what does throw some people off is that our bald eagles are not always with the white head and white tail. They can, it actually takes five years for that white head and white tail to develop. And so they can have this brown and white appearance. Um, some bird guides will actually go into the detail to show which each of the five uh, uh, color forms look like for the eagle. And uh, what I did, oh, I thought I had one comparing it to the golden eagle. We do sometimes have golden eagles uh, in Eagle River. They are often uh, soaring along the ridges of uh, Eagle River Valley and then uh, adjacent valleys. But when you see the golden eagle, when they're not hanging out down in the trees in town, in the neighborhoods, and uh, they don't have this very modeled uh, white and black pattern pattern underneath their wings. And later on, when I get to ravens, I will compare ravens and eagles as well, because they are uh, often have very similar behaviors, uh, soaring uh, over cliffs near uh, tall buildings, especially downtown Anchorage. You'll see them soaring by the old BP building or any of the downtown high rises and just along the shoreline and even the, uh, any of the bluffs along Eel River where they're playing on in updrafts or in the uh, uh, steam plumes coming out from the uh, power generation along the Glen Highway. So we have, I'm just gonna go back up to the eagle. The, this is the mature bald eagle, white head, white tail, very common, very showy. And then the uh, immature, which is uh, not having that white head and some uh, different patterns of brown and white on their wings and their bodies. Um, Li so Liza, we've yes. had a couple of questions about ducks and waterfowl come through. Okay. So first, or a couple, um, what do ducks feed on during the winter? And we shouldn't be feeding them, right? You shouldn't be feeding them. If you are very, very drawn to feeding them, do not feed them bread. Um, bread is just like for so many of us adults, just pretty much empty calories that will make their bellies feel full, but does not provide nutrition. Um, peas, seeds, uh, grains are much better options for them. But in winter, what they're doing is they are, uh, basically rummaging and finding those same kind of food sources along the uh, banks of creeks and ponds or uh, in these subsurface uh, bottoms of creeks and ponds. Nice. And, and then um, do loons overwinter here? Not here. If you go down to Seward, you will see loons, Seward and Homer, you can definitely see loons in the seawater, but not up in uh, Upper Cook Inlet. And how long do bald eagles live? Too long. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I don't know that off the top of my head. <laughs> um, yeah. And let's all make sure that our microphones are muted. And so I'm just trying to look to see if I can see the chats, but I can't. Yeah, I would, you know, that's something good to look up on Wikipedia. They are very long lived birds especially kind of having that taking five years to maturity. Um, I know they'll live into the 10 year uh, range and beyond. <clears throat> Any other? <clears throat> Sorry. I think that's covered it. Okay. Absolutely. So the willow ptarmigan are one of my all time favorite birds, especially in winter because they kind of just make me laugh. They uh, often make kind of, you, I can hear them before I see them and they'll make kind of chuckling noises, which, you know, if one person's laughing, even if it's a bunch of birds, it makes me laugh. So I enjoy them a lot. 
Hmm, sorry, taking some of my tea. Um, so the willow ptarmigan is one of actually three ptarmigan species that we do get. Um, it's the most common one. And the other one I'll show a picture of is the rock ptarmigan. But the willow ptarmigan is in winter all white except for its beak, its eye, and its feet. They are uh, most commonly found up in the higher elevations. Uh, Arctic Valley uh, was for several years an excellent place to see them. And they are still there in good numbers. But ever since several years ago, the uh, birch leaf miner uh, really decimated a lot of the vegetation up in Arctic Valley, which uh, means that they kind of eat through a lot of their good food sources and they're kind of moving to different uh, adjacent valleys as winter goes on. But you'll also see them up South Fork Valley. You'll see them up towards Mount Baldy, uh, Tarmigan Valley, Peters Creek, which is the upper portions of Peters Creek is not in our count circle. But any of those areas as you're just kind of getting out of tree line, and their name gives away a big part of we're going to find them. You find the willow ptarmigan where the willows are most common. In other parts of Alaska, you find them down at uh, lower elevation in the wetland type areas. But uh, you often will uh, not see the willow ptarmigan, but you can hear them and you can also really look for their signs. They take shelter actually under the snow where it's uh, kind of formed tunnels in kind of what's called the subnivian world, the land under the snow, the willows and blueberries, connect, connect other shrubs, actually create snow-free uh, areas under the snow banks, under the snow levels. And that's where the willow ptarmigan are finding much of their food and where they actually kind of gather together and stay warm out of the wind. And sometimes you'll see little kind of entry holes uh, in the snow where you can find a bunch of tracks you also should look around because you might find some other predator tracks in that area that are saying, hey, I know some good stuff's coming down there and they'll hide and wait for a bird to pop out, whether that's a lynx, a fox, uh, any of the weasel species. Well, I've seen uh, their tracks around uh, willow ptarmigan sites. And so large flocks, sometimes you see them in twos and threes, sometimes you see them in 200. Um, two of the other uh, common fairly common uh, chicken-like birds are the uh, uh, rock ptarmigan and the spruce grouse. The rock ptarmigan tends to live at higher elevations. So if the willow ptarmigan live where the willows are at, the rock ptarmigan live above the tree line where you really don't have much of uh, the woody vegetation anymore. Uh, my uh, memory device for them is they are the punk rockers of the ptarmigan world. They have heavy black eye makeup and they like to have their red uh, mohawks or red spiked hair. Um, you might not always see it kind of so uh, very distinctive, especially the female birds might be a little bit more dull, but you're definitely, if it's all white, it's willow ptarmigan. If it's got that black eye patch, it is the rock ptarmigan. We have a uh, several species of woodpecker, but I'm gonna only speak about two. The uh, downy woodpecker and the hairy woodpecker. The hairy woodpecker um, looks very similar to this, but so the downy woodpecker is a pretty small bird. He's actually only been the four to six inches range and the male has a small red dot or a uh, red patch on its back of its head where the female does not. Um, sometimes you'll see, be looking at a male and because of just kind of how he's ruffled his feathers, you don't see that red. Um, and uh, they're commonly found, you know, pecking on trees. They also love bird suet, uh, suet patties or just uh, fat hung in uh, uh, suet holders if you uh, are a hunter and save off some uh, trimmings or just, you know, I had a leg lamb the other day, I saved the uh, fat and I have a, a cage to put animal fat in. They love that stuff. Um, the hairy woodpecker actually has a nearly identical color pattern, but is a much uh, bigger bird. He's in the uh, nine inch range, but again, the male has a red patch on the back of the head, the female does not. They both have a white shield where their wings get, come together on their back um, with that black and white wing pattern. The biggest difference between the two is uh, not just the size, 
but their beak. If you look at the downy woodpecker on your left, his beak is about half the length of his head width. The hairy's beak is about the same size. The beak and the head are the same size. Um, one, if you have uh, a bird feeder or a uh, maybe a bird a dead tree in your yard that there you always see woodpeckers coming to, one recommendation I'll make is to you know put out a uh, stick that you've marked off in you know three inch or six inch increments. You can use that to identify. Okay, that's a bird that's six inches or nine inches because seeing uh, <clears throat> determining bird size from a distance can be really tricky unless you have a uh, you know a known object to compare it to. I also sometimes joke that a, uh, a downy woodpecker is about the size of your hand where a hairy is the size of your foot. And I had somebody do that. He told me that because he hung a boot up in his tree. And that was, you know, is it bigger than my boot or smaller than my boot was one of his uh, gauges. Um, so some questions about yes. downy and hairy woodpeckers. Sure. So first, how much do does the hairy woodpecker weigh? Do you have ideas of weight? I can look that up real quick because I know where that answer is. <laughs> they are um, really quite small, um, similar to uh, a number of our other smaller common songbirds. But uh, woodpeckers. He is less than an ounce, 0 0.95, whereas the hairy is 2.3 ounces. Nice. So. And then um, do you have any advice for uh, people who have problem woodpeckers eating up the uh, sides of their house? So there are two things that I've had success with or that I've advised other people have asked me that I've had success with is get some metal flashing. If they're pecking into the side of your house, put up some metal flashing that is not super, super firm and tight. So when they pound on it, it kind of bounces back at them a little bit. One, they'll have a really hard time getting through the metal and they, that, you know, the drumming of the metal will discourage them. If you have holes already and you, you know, you don't want to put up some ugly metal flashing, perhaps uh, packing it with steel wool. And I mean, packing it hard that will uh, deter most of our kind of vertebrate size pests, whether it's uh, shrews, voles, and mice, or it's birds trying to get in to nest, um, they just don't get through it. But I would, you know, pack it with some uh, steel wool, and then I would, you know, cover it with the, some really thick wood. Metal's always going to be uh, your best deterrent. You also might uh, hang up some other uh, bird ornaments, whether there's, uh, I have in my windows, I have, uh, you know, ornamental glass hangers. I can't remember what you call those things, but a shape like birds I put in my windows to actually help birds not fly into my window. But if you cover up the whole area, you know, if there's so many birds here, they, the other birds be a, as occupied space and they find a different place to go. Nice. And final question, is the salt content excuse me, salt content and ham fat, bacon drippings, things like that at all a concern when you're using suet? Do we need to um, worry about high blood pressure in our woodpeckers? <laughs> I'm not so much worried about high blood pressure in the woodpeckers, but uh, less processed, unprocessed is definitely better. Um, I have to say I have not put out personally uh, fat drippings from like bacon. It's been trimmed off of uh, raw unprocessed meat. Um, putting a little bit in, especially into a suet patty, if, you know, is probably going to be okay, but, uh, they are not naturally consuming a high salt diet and that is going to throw them off. Definitely. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. Sure. So one of our other kind of large birds that visits our bird feeders are the uh, jays. We have two jays in Alaska, the gray jay and the stellar's jay. The stellar's jay is this beautiful blue and black bird, um, one of our very showy birds we have here in Alaska. And uh, the gray jay is, uh, sometimes it is less common if you're to kind of to pull 
people about who comes to the bird feeder. They are sometimes very skittish and shy around people, but uh, they are definitely out and about. Uh, a, jays are in the same species, are in the same family as our ravens, our magpies, uh, crows, uh, which aren't here in uh, this part of Alaska, but in other parts of Alaska. They are one of our smartest, most intelligent bird families. And uh, this can make them very kind of pes pesky and annoying sometimes. Uh, the, the gray jay is also known as the camp robber jay or the camp robber. Um, I've had both of these uh, bird species come and steal shiny objects from uh, places where I was camping or just even stopping to eat for lunch. Um, it can be everything from uh, bottle caps to car keys, um, toy cars, also, they kind of like shiny things. Um, they're also, they are tenacious and they will figure out how to get into a package of food um, left out. Um, which can also, I'm sure you've heard about like seabirds and plastic bags and everything. These birds can be susceptible to that because they will kind of break into, um, you know, a bag of garbage that uh, was left untended or accidentally disposed of or intentionally disposed of in the wild areas. So the, one of the related cousins is the black-billed magpie. He is a quite a large bird, especially when you take into account his tail, which is often longer than his uh, actual body, body length itself. You'll, uh, they have a very distinctive, look, let me flip over. I don't think I have one in, I don't have one in flight here, but you'll see the bird flying and a, just a very long straight tail coming off of it. Uh, this time of year, you often still see them in uh, kind of sibling groups. If they were, you know, birds that hatched this year, I have a uh, particular tree by my house that I frequently have uh, five magpies and it's a sibling group that I've watched all summer. You'll also see them with uh, ravens and also to the extent uh, bald eagles as they kind of, they spend their time out and about in the daytime. And then as the sun starts to set, they are all headed in the same direction going to uh, roost sites that are often kind of uh, further up the Eagle River Valley, further towards uh, the mountains if you're in Anchorage or if you're in the kind of uh, flatter parts of Eagle River up closer to the inlet as they're flying towards the mountains. And so I think that's just kind of an interesting uh, way to uh, keep time in your day is you know, oh, it's the time that the birds are going to roost. And you'll look up and if you sit in one area, you might count hundreds of birds, mostly magpies and ravens flying overhead, going to their evening roost area. And the uh, biggest of our COVID, Corvid, sorry, <laughs> the Corvid cousins in uh, uh, the Anchorage Eagle River area is the common raven. And uh, they pretty much can be found anywhere that they care to be. They'll be in the trees, they will be in the, you know, extremely developed urban areas uh, around town. They'll be at dumpsters. They will sometimes take advantage of bird feeders. I definitely have a raven that loves my compost pile. He checks it out on a regular basis for uh, something yummy. I never see him fly off with it, but he definitely likes to check it out. And uh, I also, wanted to point out for people to really appreciate the beauty of the raven. While they appear to be a blackbird, when you really see them in the sun, they have an iridescence to their feathers that will you know, have blue tones, purple tones, green tones, and they can really just be stunning. And as I noted, you know, if you see in the evenings that they're flying toward the roost site or they're uh, flying in thermal updrafts near buildings or uh, steam. Here, I'll move on to what people really think of being as kind of their, uh, you know, their bird feeder songbirds. Although the jays, magpie, and raven are all in the songbird category. So especially if you're looking at your bird guides, they're going to be there. Um, the raven is the largest songbird of North America. <clears throat> The black capped chickadee is probably the most common bird that comes to our bird feeders. Um, on this slide here, we have actually two of our local of our local chickadee species with the uh, black capped being much more common than the boreal, although 
many people have regular uh, boreal chickadee visitors. The primary difference with these is our black cap chickadee has a black cap. He is uh, primarily black and white on the face with a uh, yellow to golden uh, on the belly. And the boreal chickadee is a brown cap with a bit of an orangier rusty, rusty color on uh, the sides of his belly. And, but they both will make fairly si similar uh, calls with the chickadee dee 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 being the uh, reason why they have that name is it matches their calls. However, they also make, can make over a dozen other calls. So if you have some at your feet or pay attention to what their calls are making. And sometimes you'll notice that the call kind of changes as we get closer and closer to spring. It gets a little bit more variety to the calls. Another common, uh, quite small bird, these are, uh, birds are in the uh, you know, three to four inch range, depending on how they're kind of spreading themselves out, is the red-breasted nuthatch is common at our bird feeders. Um, he also has a black cap, but he has, it's a black cap, white stripe, black stripe, and then white cheek. And he does have an orange chest, sometimes yellow coloring, similar to either the chickadees, but what he has a very unique uh, behavior in that he will walk straight down trees. So head first, instead of liking to be always head up, heading upwards, he will find a tree and he can walk or hop straight down head first on a tree. He will also peck into trees similar to woodpeckers sometimes, but he's just, you know, much, much smaller and has a different shape. He always has, um, even when he's uh, upright, he doesn't have kind of, his head angle is different, I guess, than a, a woodpecker. And so, you know, comparing their sh body shapes can be distinctive between a red nut nuthatch to a uh, downy woodpecker because they're a little bit close in size. A uh, similar size bird that tends not to be at our bird feeders, but is, uh, if you look hard enough, or if you're just quite lucky, uh, fairly common in our cottonwood forest, especially, it's the brown creeper. And in this picture, if you squinted your eyes, you can almost see how he blends in very well to the bark. He uh, uh, is one of my favorite birds because I'll hear him, I'll even like catch the movement of him flying in the trees. And it just can take me several, several minutes to actually get my binoculars onto him. It's like, oh, I thought it was a brown creeper. It is a brown creeper as he just moves around uh, in the trees, you know, uh, pecking for bugs, pecking for seeds. And one of my other, uh, you know, I'll admit it, I have some favorite species and the American Dipper is one of mine. Um, if you are, you know, 40 and older, you might have learned this bird as the water oozel that's O-U-Z-E-L. Um, he was formally renamed, I think around 25-ish years ago as the American Dipper. Uh, he is a fun bird because he is never coming to your uh, bird feeder. He is actually an aquatic loving bird and he'll be found the open water areas of our creeks around moving water. Um, he is feeding on uh, salmon fry and uh, insect larvae especially. And if you're around an open creek, whether it's at the nature center out on the Rodak Trail, um, even along uh, in it or as big as Eagle River, if you find an open spot, especially if you see an area where the snow appears to have been, you know, wetted down or tapped down, uh, keep your eye out for an American Dipper popping up there. Uh, you'll see them sometimes with, with as many as uh, three or four salmon fry in its beak. You know, gobble them down and it'll jump right back into the water, uh, walking on the surface of uh, the creek, looking for his next, uh, next meal. I also really enjoy these birds because they're one of the first birds that really starts singing as our sun starts returning. So in February, I'll start hearing the dipper singing along the creeks and it just is a little bit of a reassurance to me that uh, our winter uh, is moderating, the sun's coming back. And uh, as I, sometimes as March starts feeling very long some years, uh, 
the dipper makes me smile knowing that it, it will end at some point. And so. In some ways, as we are decreasing in size, the uh, gold crown kinglet sometimes comes to our bird feeders, but is more often in the tops of spruce trees. Um, is a very, very small bird, but uh, is often feeding on the cones at the tops of trees, uh, often in groups of maybe two to six, and just uh, chicken around, um, making a, a bit of a rocket up in the trees and when you finally see it, it's almost astounding that a bird that small can live here in winter. Um, I also have a small picture here of the ruby crowned kinglet, which does also occur in winter, um, just not so much in the Eagle River area. More common in Anchorage, where it's a little bit warmer perhaps. Um, up onto the a larger size bird is the Bohemian Waxwing. Um, he's gonna be in the six inch range and is often seen in flocks of 50 to even 200. They'll be eating berries, whether it's uh, mountain ash berries or perhaps it's um, our Mayday trees. We'll see them in crabapple trees. Um, and they are definitely a bird that their population has increased as Anchorage has developed and the, uh, we have landscaped trees coming in that are berry producing, whether it's you know mountain ash to crab apple to mayday trees. And one thing that I find interesting about these birds is they are actually migrating to us from more interior parts, colder parts of Alaska. And so if you ever want to think that we are actually the warm part, we are their Florida, we are their California that they migrate to for their summer, uh, for their winter time to come to a uh, less harsh climate with the uh, more food options. Um, the dark-eyed junco is actually a sparrow species that uh, we find sometimes around the feeders. They often will be found on the ground below feeders um, waiting for other birds to kind of knock seed down to them. But if you look in a bird guide, there are actually several forms of the dark-eyed junco. And we have this form that is uh, a dark slaty gray with a pale pink to orangish colored bill, depending on kind of exactly what your color perception, how you categorize it. And uh, they tend to be in an area where if you have them at your bird feeder, you might have them all winter, but if you don't have one, you might not ever see them around because they kind of pick a spot for winter and that's where they hang out. Let's see, I'm guessing no questions, Samantha. I've... Nope. Okay, <laughs> trying to get through in close to an hour, but so I might be going a little bit fast and getting this, the strangeness of a Zoom class and not seeing reactions. Um, the pine grosbeak is, uh, a fun bird in that we have a few that are like this where the male is red and the female is yellow-ish. The pine grosbeak, um, if you ever want to see pine grosbeaks, I don't know if they are keeping the bird feeders stocked up at the nature center with the building actually closed, but my gosh, they love the nature center's bird feeders. Uh, they love the uh, uh, black wall sunflower seeds especially and they do like to feed on the uh, berry trees as well and so they are pretty common throughout the residential areas of eagle river and throughout south central alaska but it throws people off they're like i saw a red bird we don't have red birds do we and that's the male and as we get closer to spring as they get into what's called breeding plumage those colors will become even more uh, bright and distinctive and that's common for all birds that they do have their breeding plumage, which is more bright, more showy. And then as their eggs hatch, um, they stop the energy, the focus of the, uh, you know, their body's energy into producing showy colors to find a mate to maybe being, you know, uh, also less distinctive. So you don't, maybe you're not as easily found by predators who might be looking for an easy meal in your, uh, your hatchlings. But that, you know, that red male and the yellowish female, 
And sometimes young birds can be in between. A, a young male might appear a bit more like a female until uh, he has actually, it's a testosterone that produces the, um, uh, the bright colors in either of these birds. And you also see them in flocks. It might be four or five, and sometimes you'll see them in the, up in the trees uh, in flocks of the 20s, uh, up in cottonwoods especially, I see them in Eagle River. One of the other birds that has uh, red on its head, but it's on the forehead and if it's a male on the chest is the common red pole, um, a small sparrow sized bird that uh, the female does not have the red on its chest. And sometimes, especially in the middle of winter, you won't even see much of a red on its uh, forehead, but it is usually somewhat red there. Um, they are one of our few birds that will actually, um, what is it, it's uh, thistle or niger seed. If you have them in your, if you put that in your bird feeder, really the only bird that you're gonna really attract and that they're really very happy and keep returning for is the uh, red pole. Um, they are a bird that some years we will have a few hundred for the Christmas bird count and some years we'll have it in the tens of thousands for the red pole. Um, some people, I've gotten calls or frustrations that they filled their bird feeder, they just put $45 of bird seed in their bird feeder and a flock of, I think it was 300 red poles came and they ate me out in two days. And when the red poles population is in an eruptive cycle, um, where the population has erupted, um, they can do that. So if that happens, if you do not want to keep investing in your bird feed, you might want to limit how many feeders you're putting out at, out at one time because they will come and just go to town. It's the all-you-can-eat buffet and uh, they're here to all-you-can-eat until there's nothing left to go. A somewhat similar bird in the kind of the brown and whiteness of it, but lacking the red is the pine siskin. He has uh, yellow on his wingtips, uh, on the edges of his wings and the, within his tail. And he also has, to me, what I find very distinctive, a very uh, triangle, like isosceles triangle shaped beak. It's very pointed. It has a uh, long uh, kind of straight line to it. It's not uh, curved and heavy like you might get in uh, the uh, red poles or the Junko's beaks. And he, as his name says, he's, uh, he's a bird that is often found in pine trees or in Alaska that's gonna be in our spruce trees and uh, will often be in larger flocks of, uh, you know, might be one or two, but you also might see them in their twenties or thirties. I particularly see these in, uh, not for an ear or sighting, but in on uh, turning an arm down by like Bird Valley as our days start getting longer. I see the pine siskins really getting active in the trees and uh, uh, feeding on the uh, spruce cones in those trees as uh, our days get longer and the sun starts really getting some warmth to it. For two birds that I'm gonna put kind of out of order, but I've got my caption, now in winter in Alaska, we have the European starling and the American robin. And I wanna just kind of start first with the American robin. Um, if you have, if you know, if you've been in Alaska for several decades, you might be surprised to learn that we do have robins in winter, and they were not really here in winter uh, 25 years ago. Their winter population has steadily grown, and it's largely, uh, most likely attributed to uh, bird feeders, that there is a reliable food source for them to be. I'll often see them in flocks of either the grosbeaks or the bohemian waxwings. They're all about a similar size. And sometimes I'll see them, I have seen them just on their own, but usually they are in a mixed flock of some other bird species. And sometimes they will also be in a mixed flock with the European starling. Like the pigeon or the rock dove, the European starling is also an invasive species to Alaska. Um, they've really, uh, they've been in Anchorage for a couple decades and we didn't really have them show up in Eagle River until about 15 years ago. And they've been in increasing numbers um, so that they are often in a uh, uh, 
sizable flock of their own, you know, 20 to 50 birds. And somebody asked earlier, kind of, you know, what do they displace? The starling can actually displace other birds by laying their eggs in the nests of other birds, but first rolling out the eggs of uh, the host species or the starling hatches first. And when its other nest mates hatch, it either, you know, it kicks them out. And so you could say a robin is now raising a starling for its young instead of its own young. And that's gonna obviously have a uh, detrimental effect at some point on the population if uh, robins aren't raising robins, but they're raising starlings. And uh, the starlings, at first they're definitely in the developed areas and they definitely moved into more kind of suburban uh, neighborhoods where you'll see them visiting bird feeders, uh, feeding on uh, the berry trees. And uh, so kind of it's an interesting development in Alaska to see how it actually has arrived here. As it just kind of moved up into, you know, up North America, the North American coast to Alaska. And that is really it that I have for the bird uh, species. But I did want to include this picture for sometimes you don't see the birds, you see the signs of the birds. You might see tracks or what I think is also really fun is you might see their, their wing beats in the snow. And this is uh, where an owl ate a bowl is this picture right here. And so you can see the, uh, the bowl tracks came and they didn't continue after he interfaced with the owl. <laughs> Awesome. So we have a couple of questions if you have some time yet. I do. Um, so a lot of people are asking questions that are a little out of the scope of this class. Um, okay. we're, we're focusing on ID, but some of the, or one question, and she's been, Sherry's been super patient. Do okay. female Jays look much different than male Jays? No, they look very similar. Awesome. And then there's been a lot of questions about um, bird feeders and Alicia has done a great job of responding. But um, one question is, I don't feed birds yet. Should I? Will any food do for a feeder? Will the birds become dependent on me? It is a commitment. I hope I did the intonation right for that, Donna. Okay. So that is a hard question. Um, I think at this point in time, there's no problem with putting up a bird feeder. Um, you definitely want to wait until the bears are truly in hibernation, which has more to do with overall snow cover than a date on the calendar. And so by this point, it's the bears, the majority are in a good uh, tucked away slumber. They will wake up during warm periods. Um, and so you always just need to use uh, some caution and common sense with your bird feeders with that. Um, concerns about the birds being dependent. Yes, it could happen, but they are also pretty resilient. And, you know, without bird feeders, birds are always moving from food source to food source. They will often eat down one area and move on to the next. I will caution people that if you put out a bird feeder and they eat it down and you don't refill it, they might have written you off and they're not going to come back when you refill it after vacation. And so, uh, you know, it's kind of, if you want birds year round and, you know, but you also want to stay in a budget, you might want to say, it's like, oh, I'm just going to put out, you know, I'm going to put out 10% every two weeks and get you paced out through the whole uh, winter. Cause they, if you, you might not have birds in March, if you let it go empty in February. And I guess the other thing I'll add is birds in Alaska are picky and the mixed bird seed that has the small white balls, that's usually millet, um, they are going to throw it to the ground. It doesn't give them the fat that they need to get through Alaska winters. And you'll more likely have a vole and shrew and rodent problem that are going to come around and say, good enough for me. Um, you can also have problems with that if you have the bird feeder over your garden and you have a bunch of shells and other stuff coming down that it will grow. You'll sprout some, uh, some plants if it's not being eaten by the birds. 
Awesome. Um, shifting gears a little bit, do you have some tips for distinguishing brown creepers from female pine siskins? The brown creeper is not as likely to be up out in the showy bits of the tree. They're going to be on the trunk. They're going to dark the deeper areas. The brown creeper's bill is curved and doesn't have that pointy isosceles triangle shape to it. And so they kind of, the brown creepers creep up and down on the tree trunks, whereas the uh, siskins kind of hop around tree tips, tree branches. Um, so, but the color pattern is similar in that regard. Awesome. There have also been a couple of questions about owls, and we don't need to get into it. Um, for those of you who are listening on our YouTube channel, uh, just in late November, we had an entire program about sawwet owls specifically. But um, just quick comments for Christmas bird count about merlins and owls. Do they show up? Are they active in the winter? So we don't have merlins. If you're seeing a bird that you think is a merlin, it's almost certainly a sharp-shinned hawk. The merlins migrate. Um, and I don't have any information on sharp-shinned hawks using any kind of nest box. The smaller owls, the sawwets and the boreals will definitely use uh, owl boxes as uh, we get into uh, late winter, early spring time. Let's see, I figured out how to uh, pull up the chat. Oh, excellent. And so I saw a question about binoculars. And I would say for binoculars, one, you want to find ones that fit your face. Um, I'm going to stop sharing. I actually carry, let's see, I have binoculars for my kids that are on the small side because it, they came together close enough that my daughter could use them. Uh, my daughter's uh, petite for her age and she could use these uh, starting at the age of four. Um, for myself, I have my own pair. And uh, I also, my binoculars are much more expensive than what I got for my kids. Uh, kids don't get expensive stuff. <laughs> um, so I'd say they should be comfortable for your face. Um, they should not be heavier than what you're comfortably comfortable holding. I've come across many birders who end up getting, uh, they're new to it. They got very good binoculars and they realized that they were actually just heavier um, than they were comfortable holding for a long time, especially if you're getting uh, any arthritis in your hands like I have. Um, lighter is definitely worth something for that regard. After that, I'd say um, within reason, um, better, the higher the price, often means better quality and better quality will give you more satisfaction in kind of getting the bird in focus. So if you have the money, I would spend with, you know, go to the top side of your budget. But uh, the are, if you go down to the Catch Mac Bay Shorebird Festival in May, hopefully it happens this year. Um, Eagle Optics always has a display, which can be really nice to kind of put your hands on a whole bunch of binoculars at one time. REI also has a pretty good selection and a pretty good price range to just kind of hold and see binoculars and see what fits your hand well, see what fits your face well. Let's see. Looking through the questions to see what other ones I might've missed. There was one about nesting boxes. Do you have any comments on nest boxes? Um, I don't um, because I think I've definitely seen birds, you know, some are successful and some aren't. And I don't know enough about, you know, what makes a successful nest box versus um, what doesn't. I know a lot of it has to do with, um, it needs to be remote enough that the bird doesn't, you know, doesn't feel threatened and exposed. And that can be one of the biggest issues, but I've seen a lot of nest boxes even by the nature center that seem to have never been used in 10 years. And I couldn't tell you why they did or not. Um, I see more empty nest boxes than utilized empty uh, nest boxes, so. And. Let's 
Well, I'll let some more questions come up. You have, I wanted to show a, a couple other, um, I had a couple of the slides that are more about the uh, Christmas bird count that just to give you some information, if uh, you're interested in joining the Eagle River count, um, let's see. Are you seeing my presentation again? Yes. Okay. And let's see. Okay. So the Eagle River count, I, I said at the beginning, it's January 3rd. Um, you can sign up by emailing me because uh, the Audubon Society is not taking online registration this year. Um, or you can go to a Facebook group, um, search Eagle River Christmas bird count and uh, kind of I'll get you the information from that as well. And I know the Anchorage bird count is not taking new beginner birders just because of uh, COVID restrictions and not grouping people together. And um, similarly, uh, we for the Eagle River count, I'm definitely gonna welcome experienced and beginner birders. Um, we have a lot of uh, very train in the Eagle River count circle, whether it's uh, driving kind of around the uh, developed core of Eagle River, driving neighborhoods or just walking neighborhood streets, also getting out on ski and snowshoe along the Eagle River Greenbelt, up in Arctic Valley, up Mount Baldy. Um, so if you wanna get out on ski, if the weather's good that day, there's a place you can go and bird by ski, or if you just wanna to stick to your car, you can do that. What we won't be doing this year is, you know, uh, putting four people in one car if they don't already live together. And uh, it is sponsored by the Nature Center. So emailing Samantha, she'll also get you in touch with me for the bird count. Um, I try and remember to say it's the Eagle River area bird count because it includes really nearly all of Fort Richardson on Jay Bear, so not Elmendorf. Um, in Eagle River Valley, it goes up to mile 7.5, which is about the North Fork trailhead access. The Nature Center is not in the count circle. And that's actually because of the age of the count circle. Um, when the Eagle River Christmas bird count was established, the nature center was not a nature center, but a bar. And there was no reason to include it in the bird count. We go up South Fork Eagle River uh, to the South Fork trailhead. So it's not, we don't have the whole valley uh, hiking out to the lakes in the trailhead, but we have uh, nearly all of the developed areas in uh, South Fork Eagle River, including South Fork, uh, the lower stretches of South Fork Creek itself and Barber Falls along the creek. And Arctic Valley, the golf course up to Arctic Valley ski area up to the ridge. And up in uh, Chugiak, it goes to the South Peters Creek exit. Um, parts of Peters Creek itself are in the count circle. Uh, the Peters Creek trailhead at the end of Malcolm Drive is not, but most of the roads up to the trailhead are in. So we have a lot of diverse uh, terrain in the count circle. And uh, if you sign up, what I'll be doing is I'll email you a, a tally list of 98% um, of the birds seen are on uh, this list of birds. We, ever, we do get a couple uh, uh, unique birds that aren't listed here. And those we go through a process to basically confirm the identification. And then as this is, it's actually a citizen science project. Um, you can download the data um, online, which is a, how I actually developed this list of uh, birds was I downloaded a, a 20 year history and uh, came up with the 24 most common birds. But we do log the uh, time spent birding to get an idea. Some years we've had just absolutely terrible weather and uh, we had just, you know, a hardcore group of 15 people uh, that did, you know, an average of two hours each. In other years we've had perfect weather and large groups. And so, all those data points get uh, uploaded to the data. So just because you saw more birds, it could be because there's more time spent birding or it could be that there were actually more birds. So um, I think those are the last of my pictures. So I'm gonna go back to this because these are the things I think are fun about winter birding is seeing the birds and seeing their sign. So other questions? We had one more question about um, do robins, are they likely to return to the same nesting spot year after year? I, I'm going to say I think that's true because I've had the same 
nest site occupied for several years in a row. I'm going to assume it was probably the same bird coming back and not a different robin coming to that, you know, crook in a tree branch. Um, but I don't think it's a, it's a hard and fast truth. They also don't reuse the same nest. They're going to build a new nest each year. Awesome. Other than that, we've had a lot of people just saying thank you. They've yeah. learned so much. They really appreciate your time. Oh, and well, I know you I for coming. Your time. You do this year after year and just you bring so much. This has been, for those of you who are still with us, um, at peak, we had 59 people. Wow. Makes this one of our more um, best attended programs recently. So thanks for coming out for, for birds. Yeah, definitely. And if you ever have any questions, you can always uh, put them to Samantha and she'll always get them to me. And I get some people send me pictures. Some people send me directions or descriptions. Ask me about what the brown bird coming to your feeder was. I might give you some ideas. So the more descriptive is better, but uh, feel free to shoot me an email or get it to Samantha to get an email to me. And I hope to see some of you out uh, birding in the wild. Absolutely. Stop sharing. All right. Looks, I'm just keeping my eyes peeled for any final questions. Yes. With that, they can reach out to you. They can reach out to me. Yep. All right. Well, thank you again, Liza. I'm going to send you an email in just a second, but I'm okay. going to I'm going to end this meeting. Thank you so much for your time. Okay. Great. Thank you so much.